this is class number two, high school homeschooling science, introductory level stuff. I like to think of this as things that everybody really should know. So it's good for everybody to do. And so what we're going to do today is try to give you an introduction to chemistry. Probably all heard the term, heard of that, chemistry. Where does chemistry come from? In around the 1600s, alchemy, which was the desire to change elements to others. The, go the biggest thing was to take a base metal, they call it, and change it to gold. Sounds like a great idea. Wouldn't that be fun? And so they were trying to find ways to do this. But they began to apply what we talked about last time, the scientific method, and they came up with what we call chemistry. It turns out that you really can't <laughs> do that. But they didn't at that time understand it. If you go clear back to the Bronze Age, you know, back when people were carrying spears and, and shields and whatever, way back in time, BC times, they understood about amalgamations of metals because bronze, which is what they made their shields and their greaves and things out of, was a combination of copper and tin. And they knew how to take copper and tin and mix them together, and you actually, they knew percentages what percent to put in, and you could make this new compound called, we call bronze, somewhat similar to brass, and you could make it, and it would made better shields and better stuff to fight wars with than copper alone. Although people had used copper armor prior to that, the bronze armor was much more moldable and shapeable, and it just, because it had a compound. So that's not a chemical reaction, but it is an amalgamation of metals. So they've understood that for, I mean, thousands of years, people have understood how, that there were elements. But we didn't understand what they were and how to use them. In the 1600s, when chemistry be, really began, scientific method applied to chemistry, they began to learn all sorts of things and to determine what the difference between different things are. And they came up with, over time, the, the, just the history, you can get entire books on the history of what we call the periodic table. And we didn't duplicate a whole periodic table here. But you've probably seen this, little boxes with little letters in them telling you the various compounds. Number one is hydrogen. Number two is helium. Number three is lithium. And it goes on from there. And these were designed originally around the properties of various elements. All of these over here tend to exist as gases. Things down in here were metals. Things over here were very specific kinds of metals. And they all have, sometimes the periods, hence the name periodic table, have names that talk about the chemical properties, which we're not going to go into that detail. But so you understand that they began to put this together just on the properties of different things. They'd find a metal, lead, and they had certain properties, and they'd put it with other metals that had similar properties. And then they found that you could organize them both this direction and this direction, and we come up with this table. They also began to discover that their atomic weights were different. They tend to go up and get higher and higher as you go through the periods. Um, their chemical properties, the way they react, if you look at fluorine and chlorine, they react very similar. They're part of the period we call the halogens. Halogens have a specific kind of chemistry. It's what I studied mostly when I was in uh, chemistry in college, because the research I did was with halogen chemists. That's what they were. They studied halogens. Bromine is another one right down here. And they would study how you added these compounds to organic compounds. It doesn't really matter. But each, each of these groupings has different chemistry that's associated with it. And this was all figured out before we understood why. Today, through mathematics primarily, that is way too complicated, even for anybody in high school, you can figure out why all that is. It, it all makes sense, but they figured it out before we even knew all that, which is fascinatingly amazing. So out of this concept of chemistry, this table represents hundreds of years of work of where they began to understand properties. And if you get a full-blown periodic table, they'll not only tell you just you know, the letter and what the compound is and what its atomic number is, but they'll put in their 
you know, ty different types of isotopes of that thing. I thought to put in there what its, uh, its electronegativity is, what its, uh, all these various properties of that particular element. And that's what all of these are. They're elements. We can call them the elementary things that you work with. And in chemistry, you take an element and you combine it with other elements in some fashion to create chemical reactions to make new things. And we'll talk about a lot of those new things later. But that's the basics of what chemistry is. It's understanding the elements that work around us. There's a difference between those elements and compounds of those elements, and we'll talk about that. So when we talk about high school chemistry, just simple overview, because this is not a high school chemistry class, but it's meant to introduce you to one and to think about it, the most important things you begin to learn is the periodic table and what the elements are. You begin to learn calculations for how we talk about them, because they have a weight. If I take a gram of carbon, it's a different size than a gram of, say, helium or something. I mean, you, they're different, so the weight matters. Some of these elements are heavier than others, and as you move down the table, they become heavier. David likes Einsteinium, you know, it's down here somewhere. It's in the really crazy stuff. Very, very heavy. Uranium is down in here. It's very, very heavy. These are heavy elements in the sense that if you have a hundred particles of a heavier one, it's going to weigh more than a hundred particles of a lighter one. Or a hundred, you know, if I had a hundred of them. If I could sit here and put out 100 uraniums and over here a hundred lithiums, they have a very different weight. So in high school, what you begin to learn is how to take all those things, and you take some concepts called weight, put it in grams, and they, they'll talk about what the weight of a thing is. They'll talk about uh, volume, so they might have grams per liter or grams or whatever in, how, in some volume, and they'll talk about the mole. And I only bring this up because it's one of those things that throws people crazy. And a mole is just a number. So David, what's, the, what's Avogadro's number? 6.022 times 10 to the 23. So it's, just think of six. The .022 is important, but it's, you know, we don't care. Times 10 to the 23. If you haven't seen scientific notation, it go, looks like this. 6.022, everybody understands the number, times 10 to the 23 basically means move the decimal point 23 times. So if you forget the 2 2 part, put 23 zeros after your 6. That's a pretty big number. Okay? It's a massive number. And we use that because at a microscopic level, when you're taking, if I took a carbon piece this big, that's like, like hundreds of moles worth. Add a few more zeros in terms of the number of carbon particles that are in some amount. So when you're talking about numbers that big, you've got to be able to grab it. So they took the concept of a mole was sort of a base amount of things. You can have a mole of carbon, you can also have a mole of uh, carbon dioxide, which has got three different elements. It's a seed and two, two oxygens. That concept of a mole throws so many people and all I want you to remember about it is if you ever run into it, if you take a chemistry class, you begin to run into it, it's just recognize it's not that complicated. It's very simply just a number. If I told you I want a bushel of wheat, you can get a bushel basket of a standard size, fill it up with wheat, you got a bushel of wheat. If I want a mole of carbon, I basically get a certain amount of carbon in grams. So if I weigh my carbon, and it tells me it's so many grams, I know how many carbon atoms are in there. Because I can compare how many grams per mole is carbon. And I know that because my periodic table tells me. And so it's all about calculations of canceling units and whatever. And it's one of the most important things that people learn in chemistry. And we're not doing mathematics today, and we haven't done math yet. So I don't want to spend a lot of time with it but recognize that this is extremely simple math that people get thrown from because they hear concepts they've never heard before. And the moles, that's that thing that grows on your face, right? I mean, that's, that, that's how people think of a mole. But in chemistry, a mole is an extremely important concept because it's just a standard 
amount of something. Does that all make sense? Everybody follow? So that's an important part of high school chemistry. The other thing is how do we react elements together? You know, if I put this chemical compound and this chemical compound in a test tube and mix them together, what do I get as a result? What do I have to do to make the reaction happen? Some I have to heat them up, some I add a catalyst. There's various things you can do to make a chemical reaction happen. But when it happens, um, you can study those chemical reactions, and that's what chemists do. Well, I was mentioning that I did halogen chemistry. You took a particular halogen compound and a particular organic compound and you mix them together and you then did analysis to find out how did that halogen, fluorine or chlorine or whatever, add to a double bond in a chemical compound. I mean, it was, it's very detailed stuff, but that's what chemists do on a daily basis. They study those reactions. So the elements they study and the reactions of those elements. And so you have to do that. The other thing that you begin to learn is the state of things. If I take pure carbon, I take a, um, you know, uh, just a block of carbon and I say to you, it's in the solid state. That's what it is. If I take that carbon and I heat it up high enough, it'll go from a solid state to a liquid state. How high do I have to get to turn carbon into a liquid? Anybody imagine? So high, I don't know that you could even imagine getting there. Some things, it takes a very high amount. Everybody watch ice melt? Ice melts at a very particular temperature. It's 100 degrees centigrade or Celsius, depending on who you listen to. No? Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Forgive me, zero degrees Celsius. I'm thinking of the boiling point already. Thank you for correcting me. It, it melts, water melts at zero degrees. So if you have zero degrees Celsius, you can take water, it's right in that state where it could be liquid or solid, it's changing. And if you heat it up a little bit, it becomes liquid, and if you cool it down, it becomes fully solid. That's ice. If I heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius, what I said before, it turns into a gas. And everybody here has boiled water at some time in their life, right? And that's what happens. So this is what we call them. We melt them and boil them. One of the things I do in my office is I'll freeze off warts. And I use liquid nitrogen. This is nitrogen over here. Nitrogen is 78% of the air that you breathe is nitrogen. There's 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen mostly and then there's 1% other. And sometimes there's maybe a little more than 1% other, depending on where you live. But that's the air you breathe. So you think, oh, I breathe oxygen to live. No, you breathe nitrogen too, more than that. If you make nitrogen cold enough to turn into liquid, it's really cold. And if you take certain things and dip them in liquid nitrogen, you can freeze them so cold that they would shatter when you throw them on the ground. You know, take a piece of lunch meat, stick it in some, uh, uh, liquid nitrogen, throw it on the floor and it'll shatter into a bunch of pieces. Because it's, it's taken that and cooled it down so much that it's made it a real solid thing so that it breaks. Um, that liquid nitrogen boils at a temperature way below room temperature. It boils. So I, I do this in my office all the time when I've got teenagers who want their warts frozen off. And I say, okay, it's chemistry lesson time. What are we doing with this? We're boiling nitrogen on your wart and it's transferring the cold, it's making your wart cold, but you're heating the nitrogen, and so it's becoming a gas. And then you take the leftover and throw it on the floor, and it, pff, it just disappears. It becomes gas instantaneously, practically, because it hits the floor, warms up, and it becomes a gas. So this state change of things is extremely important when you look at how elements behave. So one of the things that you would find if you went to a periodic table is you could find a melting point. You could find a boiling point, potentially. Now this is more important when we talk about compounds. So compounds are when we take these individual elements, and I'm just going to write them over here and write things that you're used to seeing. CO2 is one. Let's do NaCl is one. So everybody knows CO2 is carbon dioxide, or should know, right? Here's another one that everybody knows. It's H2O. 
basically what these mean is it's a carbon atom and two oxygen atoms bound together. This one is two hydrogens bound to one oxygen. This is a sodium and a chloride bound together. Every, each one of those compounds has different properties, different melting points, different boiling points, different reactivities, different things that it does. So one of the things I wanted to talk about here is a very important concept I think everybody needs to understand because when you listen to popular uh, you know, writings and things that people talk about, it can drive you crazy. If I take sodium metal, just sodium, take the Na metal, and I have a piece of sodium metal, about that big, okay, and I'm holding this with gloves, believe me, and I threw it into a pool of water, other than Christopher and David, does anybody know what would happen? What? It explodes, like dramatic explodes, like exciting explodes. <laughs> like if there's enough of it, like flames rise up and it, water goes all over the place and every chemistry student at some time in their chemistry experience has had to do this and put some sodium, elemental sodium, into water. Elemental sodium is stored in oil so that it won't react. Because what does it react with? It reacts really with the water and the air, and boom, you get this explosion. If I took chlorine gas, this chlorine right here that comes in a, usually when you find it, and it's naturally, if it's fully the element, it's actually Cl2. It's two chlorines always bind together. They just love to be with somebody. If you took chlorine gas and you breathed it like they did in World War I, what happens? You die. Or you're at least very, very damaged and very, very sick. Okay, so chlorine gas is nasty. So sodium explodes and chlorine gas will kill you. Do you know what this is when you put them together? It's what? No, it's not. It's table salt, which you sprinkle on your food all the time and you eat it. What are we illustrating here? You need to understand that when I tell you, you're going, you know, you're eating stuff that explodes. You're really not. You're eating a compound that has in it an element that if isolated by itself explodes in the presence of water and oxidizes in the presence of air, but it doesn't do that when it's in the form of table salt, which you can find naturally occurring in the world. They used to have salt mines. We go down and mine salt. What that tells you is there's a huge difference when people tell you things like, oh my goodness, that contains ingredients that are really bad for you. I could say the same thing about your table salt. It contains ingredients that are really bad for you, but it's not harmful. And you need to understand that, that until you understand the chemistry of a compound, you understand nothing about it. Because if I told you, like I did, that this explodes and this will kill you, your first thought is, it's a biologic disaster, it's a weapon. And you eat it every day. And it's not harmful. In fact, you need sodium and chloride in your body in order to have the nerves to tell your finger to go. The, the propagation of a wave of electrical impulse down your arm from your brain that tells my finger to move is got lots of sodium and chloride ions moving across membranes, as we understand it, in order to make that happen. And so sodium is actually an element you cannot live without. You must have it in your body. So that's what chemistry does. It takes a compound and says, what are the properties of this compound different from the elements that make it up? If I make, take these two compounds and put them together and they react, so what happens to sodium when I put it in water? We talked about how it explodes. So if I take sodium metal, just that, and I add water to it, what do I get that explodes? I mean, what, what, what is happening? The main thing that I'm getting is I'm getting sodium hydroxide and hydrogen. Now I'm not balancing this equation, so don't anybody get too detailed with me, I'm just showing the basics of it. This sodium and the water react and they create new chemical compounds. Sodium hydroxide is, is a very 
what we call a basic compound. It's got a lot of irritative properties. But hydrogen gas, that's explosive. And so what happens is you get a chemical reaction, which is why it does this. Now sodium loves to join with other things. It's part of this group, which notice at the two, two ends of the table, sodium and chloride, these all do similar chemistry when they're mixed together. You can do sodium fluoride, for example. Okay, I think that's similar to what's in your toothpaste. Um, so that you um, do the chemistry of it. So that's what you learn about in chemistry, is what are the properties of a compound, okay? Um, so these elements are understood by their chemical properties, and today, as I mentioned, they're understood by mathematics. You may have seen pictures of an atom. You know, when I was a kid, the atom was fairly brand new. So when you read science books when I was a real little guy, the atoms were depicted kind of oddly in things, but you'd often see an atom, they would have a nucleus in the middle, and then there would be these little electrons flying around. And you might have different numbers of electrons depending on the numbers of particles in the nucleus. And you know, you've seen those representations. And they, they can get fancier all the time, and all kinds of things about them. The mathematics of this, like I mentioned before, is very, very complicated. But we found out that all these elements are made up of the same things. They're made up of protons, which are plus ones, neutrons, which are neutral, so they're zeros, and electrons, which are negative ones. And you begin to study in chemistry what all that means. And this is where chemistry and physics come together. And the explanation of what is inside of a single atom of hydrogen, which is number one, it has one proton, one electron. That's it, okay? That um, compound has very specific properties because it has one electron. If you move it up here and make it helium, it has two protons and two electrons, totally different properties. All the things in this line over here, neon, you've heard of neon signs, right? Argon gas, helium gas, helium's what they put in balloons, right? Those, they don't react well. They're not very reactive because they have two or some subset of that in the mathematics that makes them very unreactive. All the things that are one away from that, this direction or that direction, tend to be extremely reactive because these ones are always trying to get rid of their extra electron and these ones are trying to gain one to make them look more like that because that's the perfect place. So I'm not going to go into that anymore. Understand that this is something that you study. You would take weeks of studying to learn all about some of these things we're talking about. I'm not expecting you to understand them all. I'm expecting you to be able to be conversant with it. And if you get nothing else out of this whole part of it, is this story, so that I'm explaining to you, of the difference between sodium chloride and sodium chloride is huge in understanding things. When you read popular stuff telling you that you know, they're putting bad stuff in your food and whatever. Don't just believe it. There was a study done where they took this compound, which I already told you is water. You need water to live, right? They called it dihydrogen oxide. And they did this study multiple times where they said to people, they put up big posters and talked about dihydrogen oxide is a chemical compound that kills more people every year than any other chemical compound. And they had all these statistics that were t perfectly true of dihydrogen oxide. And people were signing up for the petition to ban dihydrogen oxide from being made and put into food and put into things. Because they didn't know enough to recognize that all dihydrogen oxide is, is water. Why does, why does water kill more people than any other chemical compound? They drown. They drown in it. That's why. But people didn't know enough to say, what is that? Where did it come from? What, you know, what, is, what does it represent? And you want to be smart enough 
to not be fooled when they start telling you things that they just change the words a little bit and make you feel like it's crazy. It's like I heard somebody say, well, if I can't pronounce it, then it shouldn't be in my food. I mean, that's just nonsense. That makes, <laughs> that's crazy. You know, I can pronounce it. Does that help you feel better? Um, but there are a lot of chemical compounds that you need to understand the chemistry of them before you can say anything. You might say, well, for caution's sake, I'm going to avoid certain things because I'm not sure. That's fine. It's reasonable to ask the question, but understand what you're doing and understand that if you don't know the chemistry of something, you don't know the chemistry. The chemistry of salt is extremely important for your body, and, it, and it's important, but the chemistry of its two, up, two elements are dangerous. And that story, if you get nothing else out of this, understand that. And if you see somebody tell you, oh my goodness, there's aluminum in it. Okay, was well, it aluminum metal? Is it aluminum hydroxide? Is it aluminum nitrate? Is it, what, what, what form of aluminum is it? Because depending on the form, it'll have completely different chemical properties. Understood? Okay. So, just to reiterate there, calculations, reaction mechanisms, elements, these are all things they study in chemistry. And I did uh, four years of chemistry in college after having had a, probably one of the best high school chemistry classes anybody could ever had when I was in high school, I just got blessed with a chemistry professor that was amazing. And, um, you know, so that's what I studied. And so I knew chemistry as well as I knew anything at that time. Okay. I'm going to talk next, second half here, is I want to talk about things that chemistry practically has brought to your life. Things that you may not be aware of. This stuff that we're talking about, all of this, many hours worth of lectures to talk about each one of these things, um, has done things for us since the 1600s that you may not be aware of. So I'm going to run through some of those. The first one is this. Um, it's commonly called the Haber-Bosch process. It was a process invented to take nitrogen, which is all over in the air, but is very hard to get into your soil because it's a gas, right? And you can't freeze your soil down to turn the nitrogen into liquid nitrogen, like I used to freeze warts. How do I get nitrogen into the soil in a place where the plants can use it? And this was a huge problem in farming and growing crops for many, many years. It was very tough to do. And there's all kinds of science done by farmers where they figured out, well, if I plant this crop for a year and then I remove that or I kill it into the soil, now I can plant my beans and I'll get more beans from them because I'm fixing nitrogen into the soil. They didn't really understand that's what they were doing, but they had knew enough by trial and error and testing and hypothesizing and trying things and seeing what worked they figured out how to grow better crops. Well, these guys figured out through chemistry how to take nitrogen, turn it into a compound known as ammonia, NH4. You take a nitrogen, you bind four hydrogens to it, and you make ammonia. You've all heard of ammonia. Pretty, it's like those capsules that wake you up if you're whatever. It's, it's a very pungent smell. And you, ammonia is the primary thing in fertilizer. It's also a primary thing in explosives, just in case you were wondering. But they were able to turn nitrogen into ammonia, make fertilizer, process fertilizer in large amounts. You give it to farmers, they sow it into their field with their crops, and their crops grew bigger. The concept of fertilizer. And most of us have at some time in our life seen something like this, taken some grass fertilizer and put it on our grass or put some, you know, miracle grow into our plant bed or whatever we did, you can do things to do it. That was chemistry that brought that to pass. And once that process was figured out and fertilizer became easy to get, therefore, and cheap, that's a big part of it. You didn't have to spend a whole year sowing, you know, some special kind of clover or alfalfa or something into your thing, and, and you couldn't grow anything that year because you were growing the stuff to fix the nitrogen, you didn't have to spend that year. You just brought some ammonia fertilizer, threw it into the ground, and lo and behold, there you were, and you could grow crops again. That was a revolution in farming. It allowed them to grow more crops, better crops, and it's one of the reasons why food is so easy to get today in comparison to most of human history. 
you know, it, it's hard for us to imagine, but you can get enough calories to live on on a few bucks a day. I mean, we live well. Most of us have way more food than we really need, and that's the norm throughout the earth. Now, I, the reason people starve isn't because we can't make enough food, it's because we can't get it to them because of political and you know, wars and all kinds of terrible things, but that's a whole other subject. But from a chemistry standpoint, somebody figured out how to do this. It was never done before. Today, it's simple chemistry, but at the time it was done, it was a revolution. So that's amazing, farming. All the farming we do is chemical. I mean, we could talk about pesticides. People say, uh, my grandfather was a farmer and, and somebody was complaining about pesticides and I was with him and he, go, he looked at me and goes, I'd hate to see them try to grow my olive grow without them. Because <laughs> pests, insects, molds, fungus are a horrible problem for farmers. And they get into your crops, they'll eat them alive and you could use a chemical compound and it would kill the pest and stop it or, or stop the fungus. And we have to be careful. You want to understand the chemistry of these things. Is it good for me to go, should I go take some pesticide and take a block of it and start eating it? I mean, no, I shouldn't. It would be terrible for me. But in the amounts that you get in your food, it's, it's really inconsequential, mostly. Now, are there some that would be worse than I mean, I'm not here to tell you what's right about whether organic farming without you know, pesticides is better. I, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you need to understand the chemistry of a thing before you start spouting off at your mouth about what it is or isn't about. And that's the problem. Many people who are talking about this stuff don't even know the first thing about what they're talking about. Let's, let's go find out. Let's understand the chemistry of these pesticides. Let's understand how biodegradable they may or may not be. Let's understand it. And the people that do this science spend I mean, years studying these things and working on them and trying to improve them. And so that the problem becomes one of misunderstanding as much as anything. And there are things that have been done over the years that weren't very good. And mistakes that have been made. I, I, I've, I know some of the stories of fertilizers that look great but ended up doing bad things. And, and I get it. There have been medical things, um, medicines that had to be pulled from the market because they had various problems. Science is not perfect, we already said that, but before we start spouting off about stuff in general, recognize the chemistry of sodium chloride is not the chemistry of sodium and chloride. Before we jump to conclusions. All right, so that's enough of that. Farming chemistry is huge. What you're wearing, probably everyone in here has a synthetic fabric on, whether it's nylon or something else some sort of poly something, where we take these compounds and put them into a certain chemical reaction and we can make stuff that binds together in, in patterns and sheets of, say, polyethylene. Polyethylene is a whole bunch of ethylene molecules strung together that all bind together and you create this sheet. You know, ethylene, if you think about it, you could make, a, you know, a... Um, torch with, but yet you can wear it too, depending on how you've taken the compound and put it together. So it's just another example. But the revolution in clothing, I mean, your synthetic stuff doesn't wear out as fast as your cotton stuff does, oftentimes. A lot of people will wear solely cotton because they like the way it feels, they think it's better. I understand. I'm not here to push synthetic, you know, cloth as better than cotton or wool, it's just got, you can make, with chemistry, we can make different properties out of it. We can mix and match it. You know, your, your, a lot of your stuff is going to be combos, part cotton, part poly, whatever. It also makes plastic. We deal with plastic every single day. You don't realize how much plastic you deal with when, until you start thinking about it. In fact, some people argue it's a big problem because there's tons of plastic in the ocean and you know, I was uh, reading the other day about somebody who's come up with a plan for how to get all this plastic out of the ocean because of the currents, there's a lot of it that congregates in some certain areas and they're trying to develop these big gigantic nets to come in and kind of grab all this garbage that's in the ocean. It's all gathering together. I mean, this, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but you deal with plastic every day. You got plastic bags, you got plastic Tupperware things, you got, you know, plastic in your cars, you got plastic in everything where you look, there's plastic. You know, it's, 
it's incredible. Plastic is a chemical result. It's something that somebody did in a chemistry lab. And in fact, the story of how these things were discovered was it was accidental. They were trying to do something else and noticed there was this stuff at the bottom of the test tube. And they said, what is that stuff? And they scrape it out of the test tube and they start examining it and figuring out what it is. And somebody went, well, look at that. It's a polymer, poly whatever it was. And they figured out what plastic was. Then you take the chemistry of that stuff and you begin to learn how to use it. And then using it, you begin to learn how to mold it and form it and shape it and design it in such a way as you how to make it harder, how to make it less brittle, more brittle, more flexible, less flexible, you know, more heat resistant, less heat resistant. All these things that you learn to do by the way in which you do the chemistry of polymers. It's fascinating stuff. Most people, even in college, don't learn much about polymers. That's like postgraduate stuff. It's like very specific types of chemistry. You, I mean, you learn the basics of it, but the, the actual practical doing of it is a very big deal. It's industrial. There's another thing that's industrial that you don't think about. That's oil refining. Oil refining is chemistry. I remember when I was in college, went and visited... Um, uh, a big chemical shop associated with one of the big oil companies. And it's funny because when you're doing chemistry in a lab in college, you're weighing out little bits of something and I've got to get exactly 1.25 grams of this and exactly 1.2 milliliters of that. I've got to mix them at a certain temperature and whatever. They're doing chemistry with Dixie cups and, and you know, we're, oh, we're taking a handful of this and a big cup full of that and they're pouring into these gigantic vats and doing chemistry on a whole other level than what you do in, in school. And what the oil refining business, using the term very broadly and very loosely, has done is taken crude oil out of the ground and you can do what's called cracking and refining and you can separate out all the different parts. The oil that you use to the oil your sewing machine is not the same as the oil that, you, that becomes petroleum that you put into your car. Is not, the, the oil that you put into the, the, uh, you know, the lubricant oil is different than the gasoline, is different from the, the sewing machine oil, is different from you know, all the other things, Vaseline, petroleum jelly, they're all different parts of crude oil. When you pump oil out of the ground, it comes out as this sludgy mess that then gets put through a chemical process of refining and separating, and you create all these different fractions, and you pull them out and, and make them more pure, and they become all these different products that you use and don't even think about where they came from. So they all came from a barrel of crude oil, or actually millions of barrels of crude oil, put through a refinery. It's a messy process. There's a lot of smoke and byproducts and all kinds of stuff. But it has been a revolution in energy use in our world. It's another thing that if you think about it, you don't have to go back very far, and the best thing you could get was a horsepower. You put a big draft horse onto your wagon or hook it to the stump, and you could pull and pull that stump out. And that's what you used, was you used animals for power. Now you get your car, you got your dinky little car engine's got 110 horsepower, 120 horsepower, or whatever it is. It's, it, and they measured it this way because that's what people knew. They understood a horse. If I couldn't get the stump out, I'd get two horses. And if I was still, I'd get, I'd get Joe's horse because he had one of them draft horses, even stronger. And if I was really, I might go get somebody's oxen, you know, or whatever. And we, we'd hook it up and you could get more power. So people understood it. That's why cars are always talked about in terms of horsepower, because it was comparing it. But the energy use of crude oil is huge. All over the places you look, we use it. All chemistry. Every bit of it is, is chemical processes that can be defined. Um, I want to talk about another one. If this screen that I'm using for my notes is a liquid crystal display, right? And it's something that is revolutionary. Many of you have them on your phones and you have them, you know, on your iPads or whatever else. Do you realize that that was invented many, many, many years ago? Long before you ever saw them commonly used, it was invented. There was a one problem with it. If you, when they put a liquid crystal display, they had to heat it up to such a high heat you couldn't practically use it. 
Imagine having your iPhone, it burns you every time you touch it. You'd, you'd have to make a liquid crystal display with very high temperatures, and then it would work. And you could actually make it show pictures or whatever else. It was cruder than what we have today. But somebody, through chemistry, was looking at the properties of the compounds that they used to make it. Understanding the chemistry of those compounds made a compound that, the only way I know it, is called 5CB. It's got, you know, I'm sure, a really long name, and I don't remember what it is. But they came up with this compound that you could make a liquid crystal display at room temperature. They refined the chemistry, and today you can carry it in the palm of your hand. So you don't think, you think, oh, it's engineering. Yeah. Chemistry had a big hand in this. The understanding of the elements that God made, all of these, their properties, how they function, how they react together, and the compounds that are made out of them brings us to that, to where we have these things today. We have also learned how to synthesize proteins. It's the big thing in medicine of how to, the chemistry of proteins is really refined because, you know, I'm talking about these, the, you know, a carbon and two oxygens, right? Start looking at, you know, a, a compound that, I, I don't have one in my mind that's exactly right, but let's, let's say that we've got C6, H6, you know, O, whatever. We've got six carbons and, and a bunch of hydrogens and an OH group on this thing, and it has all these specific properties that it can have, and it has different configurations and different bonding mechanisms that all can be there. Then you start looking at things that have dozens to hundreds of carbons in them, and nitrogens and whatever, if you were to break it down, and you're talking about compounds that are so big that you, couldn't, you wouldn't even write them like that. We just give them big, long names, because it's a lot easier. And that kind of chemistry is often what we call organic chemistry, when you're dealing with living things and the, and the chemistry that goes on inside a body, goes inside a plant, goes inside of animal, whatever, that chemistry, there's a lot of that, and it's incredible. And today, we can actually synthesize proteins by using the basic building blocks and putting the pieces together and actually make proteins in a lab, whereas mostly that was completely ununderstood until recent times. That is really where chemistry has led and what they're trying to do today. I didn't talk a lot about, and I'm, I, I want to talk a little bit about medicine, and I'm going to talk about a specific story that I want to see if you can follow with me. When I was in school, there was a thing called nuclear magnetic resonance. So if I take this nucleus of a particular type, this being a lithium, because it's got three protons in it, right? This has a specific magnetic resonance signature. If I put it in a magnet and I'm able to measure what comes out when I pulse the magnet, I can see how that resonates. So I can tell the difference between a carbon bond that's single versus one that's double versus one that's triple. I can begin to discern that there's a different resonance to different compounds made in different ways when I do it. And it started with simple compounds. You know, put a one carbon compound into the tube, pure, spin it for various reasons, put a magnet on it, and you could see it had a particular signature. Then you put a bigger compound, and you know what it is from other things, and you look at the signature, and it would be different. And then you take an unknown, and you could look at the signature and go, oh, it looks like it's got a methane group, and oh, it looks like it's got a hydroxyl group, and there's, there's all these things. And so I can begin to discern what is the structure of this unknown molecule. Fascinating stuff. I mean, I, I loved it so much that it was where I spent a lot of my extra time because it was just an amazing thing. It's a lot of math involved, a lot of physics involved, and it was revolutionary in understanding unknown compounds. Because sometimes you take some of these big compounds, you put them in a chemical reaction, you don't know what you got. It doesn't look any different. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And you're trying to figure out, well, what do I have? So then you put it through a bunch of tests 
When does it, does it melt? Does it boil? How high? How low? What does that tell me about it? Does it, um, what does it look like when I put it through a separator? How many different compounds are in there? If I do a mass spectrogram, I can tell certain things about it. If I do an infrared spectrogram, I can tell so many things about it. And then this new one was nuclear magnetic resonance. I mean, it was just incredible. And that was all anybody thought it was for, I assume, when it started. And it was a big deal. And they used bigger and bigger magnets. I remember we had a 60 magnet. And um, 60 Tesla, I think, is actually what it is. I don't hold me to that. But then um, there was a place that some of my friends got to go over at the Air Force Base where they had a 360 Tesla magnet. That was a huge deal. Oh, my goodness. Now that's just like passe. I mean, it doesn't even matter anymore. But, you know, the bigger magnet, you could do more with it. And, and, and it was impressive. And you had to do certain things to, to limit all of the variables, and you'd find out. What that had turned into during my lifetime, right at that time, was beginning, was what all of you have heard of today is called an MRI. It's just take the NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, flip it around, it's magnetic resonance imaging, is what they did. And by taking uh, mathematics and looking at the human body inside a magnet, you can find out how to look at the insides of your body without cutting you open. And it's amazing to see. I mean, even now with mathematics, they can rebuild you in three dimensions. You know, we can look at how big your liver is and how big, where your kidneys sit and how much of this you got and how much of that you got and what's over here. You can look at detail that's amazingly refined. All of that comes from chemistry. I mean, it's engineering to, to bring it to pass, to make a magnet it's, that fits the bill. It took a while. We went from 60s to 360s to these, you know, you go, if you ever seen an NMR, I mean, the magnet fills a room. Gigantic magnets. Um, so that engineering part of it. And then the mathematics. It took mathematicians and physicists to sit down and figure out all the mathematics. How do I write a computer program? You couldn't have done it without computers. And there's a, there's a special uh, mathematics thing called a Fourier transform. Now, don't ask me, because I don't understand a transform of any kind. And I know there's many of them. Let alone, really, I, I, I learned the basic math of a Fourier transform in college, but I, I was right at the vestigial stage. Like, it's like when you were learning to read and you knew what an A sounded like and a T sounded like, and you were feeling pretty impressive. That's about the level I was at in the mathematics. Some of my friends here have done much more with it, and there's a specific mathematics. And if you do it over and over and over and over and over again, because it's a repetitive thing, you get real data. And they took this mathematics, took the engineering, and the chemistry, chemical properties of the water inside your body, and they're able to look at what happens on the inside of you. That's chemistry. It's fascinating. It's amazing. So now, this time, I have not spent a lot of time talking about the Bible part of it. Because to me, chemistry is, that's what it is. This is science, and it's really maybe its purest form. Because you literally can take lead, put it in a vessel, and heat it up. And if you do this experiment, and I do the experiment, somebody else does the experiment, and you, we take care of error, we do it multiple times, we'll all figure out the melting point of pure lead is the same. It does not change. But in Peter, 2 Peter, God says there's coming a judgment day when the elements will melt with a fervent heat when the judgment of God comes. Now that is intense. Because I already told you, take carbon, try to melt it. And it's, it's pretty intense. How, how do you get rid of carbon? How do you melt carbon? It's what diamonds are made out of. Okay? They come out of heat and pressure. But God's judgment is going to be so severe that even the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. Heat is a big part of chemistry. You learn it. Some reactions release it. Some require it. Various things. But God's going to do one huge chemical reaction. He's going to melt everything. And he's going to completely renovate the world and refine it. It's incredible. When we look at Jesus, the other thing I want to mention, 
Look at Jesus, and they're trying to describe what he looked like. John's trying to describe him. Ezekiel's trying to describe things he saw. Daniel's describing when he saw. Um, his skin that you could see shined like brass. It had, a, it had a quality to it that was just really intense, enough that they had to comment on it. His eyes flamed like fire, and his hair was white like wool, and, and there seemed to be a glow, a shining coming up. What is that all about? What is, what is going on there? What's the difference? Because we know that when he rose from the dead, they saw him, they felt his hands, they sat down, they, he fed them, he, you know, all these things. I mean, he, he looked... In fact, they walked with him on the road to Emmaus. They didn't even know who he was. They, he didn't seem like any different than walking with any of the rest of us until he spoke certain words, and then they knew. There was a revelation. But then we see him in these times when he's, when he's shining. There's something about these elements that we, we talked last time about how we're limited by our senses what you can touch, what you can taste, what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can hear. You're limited to that. Science is limited to that realm. These elements, that we, as we understand them, this place that we're talking about, is only a subset of the elements of God. That's the point I'm trying to make. We never want to forget that. That the way God makes things is much greater even than this. And he created all of this. And it is just fascinating stuff. To me, I loved this stuff enough that when I was in college, I was taking both biology and chemistry. And I loved the chemistry so much, I just sort of dumped the biology. Even though I needed it for medical school, I took what I had to take. But I just, I, I, this stuff is fascinating. And what's amazing is how it all just falls in place. It's like that pr- puzzle, when you get all the pieces done, you, it all fits together, makes the perfect picture. And you go, whoa, that's amazing. I mean, this is the most intense puzzle you could ever imagine. And over all these years, somewhere in the neighborhood of 450 years, 420 years, whatever it's been, chemistry in a scientific way has been applied and we've come up with all of this stuff that we've been talking about. And it's a great thing to know. And it's something that some people may be fascinated by. It's good to know where it comes from so that when you speak to people, you know, you, you recognize, you understand what they're talking about. But we hear it here all the time. I don't need to go minister to people by my knowledge because I'm just going to be a failure anyway at it. But it is helpful to, when you're working in areas of government, you're working in areas of public policy, you're working in areas of teaching people, to just understand how things work. And that's what this is about. It's just giving you a sort of overview of what chemistry is. Why does people exalt science so much? Well, because we wouldn't have all the food we have without it, according to how they would view it. You and I know that God is our provider, and if he's got to get ravens to go find some and bring it to us, he'll do it. He'll do whatever needs to He, he made manna fall from heaven for the children of Israel. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things that God will do and he'll multiply the bread as Jesus did. He'll just take the bread and multiply it and then have his disciples multiply it and, and 5,000 to 10,000 people or more would be fed. We know God can do all these things and will do all these things and that's how we want to minister by. What we're talking about is just the understanding so that we're not those people that are just totally caught off guard by why, does, why do people in the world exalt science so much? Well, you know, it's pretty impressive stuff from a certain point of view. And so that's what we're talking about. So that's the end of this class. Does anybody have any questions about chemistry? I mean, I, I think it's pretty impressive to try to do all that in an hour. I tell you, it's tough. Anybody have any questions about any of this? Anybody thinking about taking some chemistry at some point? Yeah. Yes, sir. My basic belief on that is that everybody should have a knowledge of high school science, at least. You may not go to college, and you know, if you're studying, I don't know, you're gonna be an elementary school teacher, you really don't need to know differential equations and high-level organic chemistry. It's just, it's not useful 
to you. But to have a knowledge of high school level chemistry, physics, biology, I think everybody can have it. I, I really do. It's, it's an important thing. Some people are going to be more acclimated than others. David and I were talking on the way over. There were certain parts of chemistry for me that were just, I could see it. It made sense to me. It was very easy for me to understand. There were other parts that I had to struggle with, I had to work harder with, I had to apply myself. He told me the same thing in physics. There were certain things that just came to him, but other things he had to really work through. I'm sure Chris read the same thing. They're just parts where when you get into a high level of science, there's some things that they tell you and they're convinced of it and you're looking at it and going, I just don't see it. And then you're trying to make this calculation work, this experiment work, this understanding work, and you're not getting it. And everybody goes through those things. But that, at a high school level, that doesn't happen, I don't think, for the most part. Anybody can do it if they just apply themselves to the basic knowledge. But what happens, as I've thrown out to you, all these terms, look at all these terms we've used that maybe you didn't know how to define them. And I, I was using the mole as an example. And it, many kids I've seen in high school chemistry get thrown by that one concept. They just can't deal with it. They have to understand what it means. It just, it's a collection of particles. That's all it is. How many of them do you have? I have a mole's worth. Okay, that's it. It's just like if I said I had a, a container's worth or a building's worth or in this case in a universe worth or whatever it is. I got so many and I know what so many, how many that is depending on what I have. Because if I have a ba bushel of feathers, that's different than having a bushel of, of iron. They're different things, but they're both a bushel's worth. So I can have a mole of something. And it's just huge numbers, which makes people crazy. But that's just one example of all these terms you have to learn and you have to wrestle with and define. And I think that's important because now I can speak intelligently about a lot of different subjects. I can understand what people are talking about and I don't get fooled as easy. In one of the subsequent classes from now, we're gonna talk about, it might probably be the end, we're going to talk about statistics and percentages and graphs and scales and all the things that people do to fool you. And you deal with it every day and don't realize it. When they tell you that something is, you know, 90% of, it's just like I told you, that dihydrogen oxide is the most dangerous chemical in the entire world. More people die from dihydrogen oxide than any other chemical. It's a statement that's made. It's not a false statement, it's a true statement. But if you don't understand the context of the statement, you don't know what it means. And there are so many things like that in marketing where people will throw out this thing, oh my goodness, 90% of people who took this uh, got better and said they felt better, but it doesn't mean anything. Or you don't understand what the parameters around the experiment were, if there was even an experiment at all. You know, it, and. It's understanding how to judge a thing that people say without being fooled so easy like people are. And it happens all the time. Now, what's better than that? Because there's something better than that. It's called spiritual discernment. You know, not being fooled, a lot of it is saying, Lord Jesus, you lead me. And there are many things the Lord may lead you to do and it won't make any sense to people around you because 90% you know, of people that walk that way die. God told you to go, so you go. I mean, that's where we really want to live. It's more important than this. But these are simple things that you can do to when you, know, you begin to understand that just because it's got a long chemical name doesn't mean the chemistry of it's dangerous to me. It might have a property that's amazing. And sometimes you have to ask people, okay, would you like us to go back to the era before we had that? You know, there's chlorine in your water. Do you know why they put chlorine in your water? because it kills bugs and parasites and things that you can't see that are in your water that can make you really sick. So is chlorine in your water a good thing? Yeah, when you get the whole picture, but too much is a problem. It, it would not be good. You know, you don't want to drink pool water, but you'll swim in it, right? Okay, so that's, that's really what we're we're talking about. So what do you need to know? I think a basic high school, look, I would love to teach an entire chemistry class. What would be required? It would take a lot of time, so you've got to have a certain amount of money for your time. It would take a lot of students who are willing 
to get that class and willing to take the time and the energy to do it. And then think about how much money you'd have to spend. If you really want to do a good chemistry class, you've got demonstrations. You've got a pressure box. You've got uh, chemicals to, to demonstrate various things. You've got some water and a little bit of elemental sodium so you can blow it up in the classroom and show everybody how cool it is or whatever it is because you're trying to get kids' attention to pay attention. I'd love to teach that class, but there's a lot of infrastructure you need to teach a class like that well. We're talking about stuff theoretical. I write a few things on a board. I give you some descriptions verbally. That isn't everything about chemistry. Chemistry is a very visual science. You've probably heard Pastor Mark. He'll mention, um, you know, if you take the test tube and it's supposed to turn green and it turns purple, you did something wrong. And he's using as an example of, look, if you're supposed to be walking in joy and you're sad, something's wrong. It's just using your basic understanding to say, okay, I recognize when this isn't lining up. I did everything right, and the test tube's the wrong color. You didn't do everything right. So let's go back and figure out where you made a mistake. And that's one of the things about chemistry, is you, have, you learn you have to be extremely precise when you say something. You gotta know what you're dealing with. I still remember one time I was taking this class we called it organic chemistry lab. It was basically dealing with unknowns in organic chemistry. And one of the things they would do in lab is they give you a bottle of some solid or some liquid and say, go do tests on this and then tell me what it is. And these were very complex ones because this was a high level, only you know, high level chemistry majors in this class, right? And so you'd get this stuff and you'd go and you'd say, okay, what, what, what temperature does it boil? It, what, when does it become a solid or can I cool it down enough? What about if I react it with this? What if I test it with that? What if I add, what's the pH of it? I mean, you just do all these tests, and then you had this book with all these trees and keys that you'd run down, and you could find what was this by its properties. And I did all this on this one unknown, and I come to this conclusion that it's uh, whatever chemistry, chemical it was. And I said, oh, that's it, and I've got all the proof of it, and I turn it in, and it comes back marked wrong. That's a bad feeling when you're me. I was not happy. So I went back and started figuring out where did I mess up? Because I'm going to find this out. It turned out I wasn't wrong. So was the other person wrong? No, they weren't wrong either. Turned out there were two compounds you couldn't tell the difference by all the tests we had available. And I was able to point out to the teacher why the book was wrong and how these two things could not be discerned based upon the tests we had in the book and that my conclusion was correct and their conclusion was correct, we couldn't tell the difference. And, I mean, this is what is fun to do, <laughs> is to dive in and to figure these things out. How does it work? What does it do? And that's, that's basic chemistry. And then you get into the real world, and it's all about these industrial things that people are doing. But somebody has to make nylon. You know, they make nylon. They make bulletproof vests out of chemical polymers. It's incredible stuff.